So again, welcome everyone to the latest installment of Crisis Mappers webinar series. Um, what I wanted to do really quickly was just to give you guys a little bit of context around around Oculus. And the best place, I think, to start there is kind of who of our friend and partners. Um, obviously, working with Crisis Mappers over the past few years, uh, the Ushahidi organization, um, and some of our commercial partners as well, yes, Sarai and Microsoft. Um, from a from a customer standpoint, who are the uh, who are the people that we deal with? Who 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 are the uh, the individuals and organizations that we work with? And they really fall into to one of three categories: um, on the defense side, the public safety, law enforcement side, as well as financial institutions. And the things that we do with these organizations all revolve kind of around a central theme, and that is solving complex problems visually. Um, a great example of this, when you're looking at uh, any organization that's doing uh, any kind of financial analysis, um, investment, um, uh, strategic assessments, those types of things, um, you know, these are individuals who have, you know, just <laughs> boatloads and boatloads of data that they have to try to make sense of. Um, and this is a, this is a problem of, of being able to, uh, to, 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 to do something with all this data, to be able to extract answers and then to be able to make decisions there. So that's one of the things that we really focus on in Oculus is trying to present the data in a visual fashion so that we as, as human beings can make decisions with that. Some of the projects that we've worked on um, in the past, uh, like I said before, uh, working with the Crisis Mappers Network over the past few years, um, the vast uh, um, symposium, so the, sorry, excuse me, the vast competition, which is part of the IEEE symposium, um, is, uh, is something that we participated in uh, for the past, I believe, five years now. And I think every year we've walked away with, with at least one award uh, for our participation there. So definitely, uh, uh, something that Oculus um, is, uh, is is very uh, is very invested in um, is 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 on the research as well as partnership side um, in, in a lot of the work and projects that we do. To give you an example of how we how we try to approach these complex data problems and how we try to come up with solutions, um, I'll give you uh, this problem, which is trying to understand the movements of a, of a human being um, based on the position of their cell phone. And so this uh, in this case, there was a, an individual who volunteered to have their cell phone uh, uh, pinged about once every hour, I believe it was, for two years. And this was a research project to understand uh, uh, human movement behaviors. And you can see all those dots represent a moment in time where this individual was. Now, if I were to ask you, um, how often does he go to California in the summertime? Um, that's a pretty difficult question to ask with just the data being represented the way it is. Um, obviously, you'd have to go back to the, uh, the raw table and look through that manually to, uh, to see when he made trips out to California. Now, if we, if we connected those dots together, you could at least get a track or a, uh, an interpolation between those points to see you know, where has the individual been based on other points, but you're still not going to get a real understanding of the timing of his uh, of his movements. So what we came up with was a uh, kind of a novel idea of adding a timeline as the third dimension. And this is a this is a, a way for us to to kind of solve that problem of being able to understand movement over time um, as well as space. And so here you have this timeline that's been added vertically where time goes downwards, and we have the position of the individual on the map. So now I can easily answer the question of how often does he go to California in the summer um, just simply by looking at the timeline and, and spotting where uh, he goes off to the California area. So um, just an example of, of, of showing you how um, Oculus approaches these kind of hard data problems. Um, some of the applications for this would be looking at uh, movement data, so it's like we were looking at right there, um, crime analysis for crime reporting, um, communication analysis, as well as uh, social network and financial transaction analysis. So that's it uh, from my end. I'm going to hand it over to Jen, and uh, she will introduce uh, today's speakers for everyone. So without Great. further ado, Jen. Thank you very much, uh, Curtis, and also Adil. And we always like to thank our partners at Oculus Geotime for hosting these webinars uh, for us. And so welcome, everyone, to the next installation of the Crisis Mappers webinar series. We're really delighted today to hear from Hayden Strauss and together with John Pole from the Thetis Corporation. They're going to be presenting some interesting ways of analyzing and visualizing sort of the complex data that we collect in crisis mapping um, through their knowledge management program called Savannah. So uh, without further ado, let's turn it over to them. Thank you very much for joining us. Great. Uh, this is Hayden Strauss, and thank you very much, Curtis and Jen, for the introductions and the uh, brief presentation there. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll share my screen here, and we should come into a presentation. So, as Jen mentioned, uh, there are, are two people from Thetis on the call currently, um, Hayden Strauss and myself. I'm a systems engineer at Thetis Corporation, and John Polay, who's primarily on the business development side of, of efforts. Um, as we go through things today, um, 
Savannah is, is a, uh, a software product meant to provide a simple, intuitive approach to complex analysis. So as far as what we'll be talking about today, um, you know, we'll spend probably about 10 minutes, 15 minutes going through background of the company, a little bit of the overview of the product, um, but I'll reserve most of the time today for a live demonstration. Um, through the live demonstration, I, I picked a scenario around the Pakistan floods. Um, my intention is to give you a good sense of, of functionality of the application as well as how it might be used in your environment and how it might be integrated with some of the other tools in your environment to, to really open up the, the suite of tools and leverage the data you guys are collecting. Uh, at the end, I'll try and leave 10 or 15 minutes for questions and answers, um, as we're sure I will generate some questions. So that being said, um, I'll get into things. Somebody you know, just yell if, I, uh, if my slides go away or, or something, just let me know. So a little bit about the company. Um, similar to, to Oculus, um, we work in similar spaces in defense and, um, and Intel and financial. Um, but backing up before that, you know, we were founded in 2003. We are based in Portland, Oregon on the West Coast. Um, our flagship product, um, for the first six years of the company was called the Thetis Publisher. And I won't go too in depth here, um, I promise. I just want to give you a kind of sense of who we are and what are, are, are some of the problems we like to try and solve. So our first product is called the Thetis Publisher. And what it is is essentially an inference engine or an ontology engine for those familiar. For those not familiar, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's back-end capabilities that allow us to, to expose unique functionality to the end user through our Savannah application. So what we did is we released our first version of Savannah in 2009, um, really building on our own technology to provide a user interface that's very easy to use, um, robust in the way that it's deployed and, and interacted with, um, to help the panelists make better decisions as they're going through problem spaces. So as a sort of tagline of what it is we do, we're an enterprise software company that helps people research, document, visualize, and model complex systems. Also similar to Oculus, um, we are very partner-centric in the way we like to deploy. Um, a lot of the value we bring to deployment as being the glue between not only the different um, data sets and the different ways that the data is being collected, but the different tools that are available for visualization, for analytics, and for enrichment of the information that's coming into the system. So some of the partners you see there, um, Metacarta does geotagging of unstructured data, Johnya does identification of entities within unstructured data, um, Kapow does open source scraping, anyway. We work with a number of technology partners to make our analysis application a more robust option. One of the ones that we've been recently um, looking into, or I've been recently looking into due to, to interest in the crisis mapping world is the Ushahidi um, application. And I think that, that there's certainly a, a good integration path for bringing that type of functionality into our environment, um, of which I will, I will speak to as I go through the live demonstration as to how it is that we can leverage some of the the information and the maps that they're producing uh, in our environment in a more cohesive uh, manner across other tools and data sets. So that being said, I'll get in a little bit now into the product itself. I'm kind of spend, I think I have three or four slides here, um, give an overview of the product, a few minutes, and then we'll get into a live demonstration. So Savannah, as I mentioned, it's really uh, primarily focused around helping analysts make better decisions faster. Um, as I mentioned, disparate people, disparate data, and disparate analytics. And that's really where Savannah comes in, is being an enterprise application that allows for the integration of those other systems into a broader system for, for complex analysis. Um, throughout the process, we keep lineage on who's making what changes when and where, so that we can figure out how we're arriving at the different conclusions we are, who's arriving at those conclusions, and how we might leverage existing um, expertise in particular fields to arrive at better conclusions. Um, and of course, being able to persist and collaborate on the information that we're deriving throughout the, the process of the analysis. So speaking just very quickly to the graphic there on the right, that is the full Savannah stack, um, leveraging our own core technology, the publisher, um, up through the client browser, which is what I'll demonstrate today. Um, on top of that are a couple of different applications that have been developed from the Savannah framework. So it's really meant to be a, a flexible um, user interface to the application as well. So the application I'll show you today is heavily focused on or was originally deployed around socio-cultural analysis, so it's very free-formed. It provides a lot of hypothesis testing. It provides for data organization um, and some visualization of different systems. We've also focused in this version uh, on solely on unstructured and geospatial data. 
So we have a lot of reports, message traffic, that type of information within our environment. Um, that being said, Savannah 2, which is what I'm showing you today, was released last September. Savannah 3, which is our newer version, will be released this coming uh, winter. And really what it is focusing on, um, and I know I haven't given you a lot of context for Savannah 2, but extending upon what I'll show you today, it's focusing a lot on structured information, um, more interactive outputs, so being able to produce um, live materials that can be used offline, and also being able to have a more cohesive, collaborative environment between the different tools that we're using today. So that being said, um, it's a very unstructured application meant to bring a number of tools and, and data sets and systems into a single environment. So it's a very uh, easy to use environment. Other applications of, of our software have been around Keras watch listing, um, which isn't of interest necessarily to this group, but, but one of the things that's nice about it is it provided us for a very good backbone for um, developing expert networks. So creating profiles about people, asserting the properties of those profiles or those people onto the profiles, and also being able to add the activity that they're performing onto their profile. So that being said, uh, flexible uh, throughout the, the process, throughout the deployment. So if, if what you see today has a number of components that are interesting, um, the idea is that it can be tuned, tweaked, and, and worked into an existing uh, enterprise environment. Sort of from a, a more technical benefit standpoint, um, the first of which is going to be model driven. So when I talked about the publisher being an ontology or an inference engine, um, the idea there is that at the core of our application, we have a representation of how everything relates to other things. So we have a representation of how a person relates to an organization. We have a representation of how a person has policy or permissions to use different tools and different data sets. Anyway, I won't go too much in depth, but the idea there is it provides a lot of flexibility, a lot of specificity for given problem spaces. So if you're working on something in Nigeria and you need to know where wealthy regions are, um, wealth is going to have a different definition in Nigeria than it might have in the U.S. So being able to apply those different notions of, of how things, how words are used within an environment uh, that you're interested in. Browser-based, so it makes it a, a very easy to use, very easy to access as long as you're on the uh, a network that it's deployed on. So in today's demonstration, I'll just be hitting our demo server that's on the, the Internet. Uh, makes it easy to update, easy to work with others, extensible. So as I talked about, some of the Ushahidi uh, integration potentials and some of the other data option integrations, so things like Twitter that may be of interest uh, to this, this group. Um, those are the kinds of things that are, are relatively straightforward to do. Uh, and the last bullet point there, data agnostic. So trying to bring together the, the geospatial information with the tweets, with the reports that are being produced with, with all of the other surrounding information within the environment and pulling that into a single environment so you can get that holistic view of the information. The last slide I have is an architecture slide. I will be very high level here, um, very broad in the way I talk about things, but I just like to give a sense of kind of how it deploys and how it could, could, uh, could interact with your environment. So as I mentioned, the core, the publisher, our sort of first product for the first six years of the company. Um, it's really the brain behind the application, managing all of the, the models uh, that drive the application, tracking all of the metadata, and managing all of the workflow for the application, so as to, you know, who needs to fill what forms in, when, where, and why, and what needs to be output, uh, as well as providing inference capabilities. So if I, you know, connect Hayden to Thetis and I connect John to Thetis, I can then come in and say things like, who works for Thetis? Or, how does John potentially know Hayden? And it can say, well, they will both work for the same company. So being able to infer and understand how, how systems and uh, networks are connected within each other. The other piece I'll mention here uh, on the orange side there, so the content manager. So that's where we're integrating uh, data sources so that we can federate searches, so that we can get that, that sort of combination of the most meaningful information. And then the last piece down there on the enrichment services is where we're we're really integrating a lot of tools that, that provide uh, more automation and discovery capabilities. So being able to process unstructured information and get some sort of meaning out of that, whether it's just a list of people that are mentioned in it, or it's a list of places mentioned in it, or something of the sort. Last piece I'll mention up top in the green, 
uh, the client browser, which is where I'll be accessing the application through today. Uh, so thin client base, and from there we'll reach out to the different geospatial services. So I'll get my different base maps as well as my different dynamic services from something like an ESRI server uh, or, or something else. So that being said, I will, uh, I will get into a demonstration here and kind of spend probably 15, 20 minutes just walking through the functionality. I don't want to overdo the demo, but I want to give a sense of, of what's possible within the environment. So if I don't go in depth enough, I'm more than happy to provide follow-up, um, follow-up demonstrations or follow-up material, um, which we can address here as we, as we go forward. So here I can authenticate. Um, I'm authenticating on an LDAP server in this situation, but we also have local authentication within the system. It then loads up all of the different tools that I'm allowed to use in my environment, given the group that I'm a part of. And the group that I'm a part of in this situation is an analyst group. So the idea there is that you can have different groups with different visualization or different um, reporting capabilities. So if Jen only wants to know all of the crisis mapping uh, options or, or events currently happening. She probably wants just a view of a map with some dots on it, with some high-level information. Whereas if you have someone on the ground in Pakistan who's trying to plan the event, they're going to have a completely different workflow. They're going to need different tools. They want to have some reporting capability back to Jen, but at the end of the day, they need more robustness in their, in their tool set. So they come into the environment, spending a moment here just uh, talking through the dashboard. On the left side, or the idea of the dashboard is really to provide notification capability as well as navigation capability. So on the left side here, you get a high-level view of the data that is within the system. So in this case, I have a local database or a database that is local to the server um, that has Wikipedia information, New York Times information, the yeah, Factbook information. And below that, I have a feed of information that's coming in. So what I'm saying here is show me the data that's come into the system over the last 24 hours. It then takes all of the geospatial references within those documents and it heat maps them over here on my map. So if I'm uh, interested in a particular region, um, I can kind of say, you know, there's some, some hot spots coming in over Pakistan or the north of Pakistan, what kind of uh, activity may be occurring. The middle pane here is navigation between the different workspaces that our, our users are, are interacting with. Um, these are collaborative workspaces, so multiple users can edit the same workspace. So here uh, I have things like Health and USA, the Japanese government. But for today's presentation, I want to show you the, the Pakistan flood scenario that, that we've developed. So I'll load that up. It'll take just a second to kind of come through. I'll spend just a moment walking through the, the workspace that you see here. And then I'll, I'll really dive into the, the process that I took and the tools that I leveraged within the environment uh, to make a decision about the Pakistan floods. And I'll, I'll give you a sense of what it is I was trying to solve as I was going through that scenario as well. So coming into the environment, the first thing you probably notice here is in the middle pane, these buckets of information. So these are just flexible buckets that are, are meant to house uh, different um, categories of information. So when I came into this problem space, I didn't really know anything about Pakistan. I didn't really know much about the flood that occurred last year. Um, so I started with getting just background information, pulling together things like documents, things like maps, things like link charts. So these different uh, icons here represent different items that have been brought into this, this bucket of information. I will go into those in a moment, um, but walking through this process a little more, uh, I spent a minute then getting background information about the flood itself, um, you know, trying to get a sense of what problems it is I might be trying to solve, trying to figure out and who is doing what where, what work currently in the environment, um, and then what they're, they're up to and how I might be able to help. So what I've done, uh, and I actually had a slide about this uh, in this scenario, is I've, I've been tasked with evaluating the impact of the 2010 flood and then determining how my NGO, and in this case I've just made up an NGO that is mine, um, can provide support to the regions that need it most. So given that scenario, all data is unclassified and open source in this scenario. Um, sorry, I meant to show you that before I got into this, but uh, as we're into the environment here, the first thing I wanted to do after I had a sense of the background was I wanted to plan. I wanted to get a sense of, of you know, what it is I was trying to solve, Then I wanted to do some research, figure out, you know, now that I've defined my, my problem space, get a sense of, you know, what's out there, what data exists, but I need to do some analysis on that data, figuring out, you know, where, where I wanted to work, where currently, you know, we have people deployed, and figure out some, some distances and things like that there. And at the end of the day, 
I want to be able to not only collaborate in my workspace and let users log in and see my, my live uh, information that I'm producing, but I also want to be able to publish that somehow. So we have production options for outputting PowerPoints and PDFs uh, that are, are created here in the environment. As I go through this, um, I will make reference, I will mostly talk about Savannah as you see it today, but I will occasionally make reference to Savannah 3 um, because it is in beta and I have started to see the functionality so I'm starting to, uh, to believe it's really there. So getting into the, uh, the workspace itself here that you're seeing, the first thing I'm going to open up here is my, my planning module. So with each one of these modules, they're up here in the top right. So we have things like mind maps, maps, link charts, you know, documents, search, images, things of that nature, the different tools that I want to bring into my environment to make it a more robust analysis process. So here, within here, I'm just going to delete a couple of these. Off in the middle of nowhere. Um, I'll kind of zoom in. I'll, I'll walk through. I won't spend too much time walking through because I know it could be a bit tedious. Um, but first, I want to make a, a definition of the problem. So the very first thing I did is I laid out a problem node here. So in creating these mind maps, I have the ability to very easily drag and drop from the left pane here these different high-level concepts. So it's not meant to be a forensic representation of, you know, how. Caden works with Adis, John works with Adis, but it's more of a conceptual walkthrough of how we're going to achieve uh, the goals that we need to in a given process. So what I've done is I've dragged and dropped out this problem node. You know, I've typed out the Pakistan floods, and I've typed out that whole thing um, to kind of say, you know, bad things are happening. A lot of the country was underwater. Um, 20 million people were affected. Uh, death toll close to 2,000. And then what I've done here is I've actually associated a document with that node as to the support information um, that, that is the support information for how I found my problem. So here what you'll see is this very first paragraph here in that, that document correlates to this, uh, this problem statement that I've done. So this is the supporting information that's been associated with it um, in the process. But backing out from that just for a moment, um, kind of laying through, you know, I've determined that this is an exploratory research effort to evaluate the locations of high level of damage, determine where aid is currently being provided and where my NGO can provide the most support and through which activities. So I have some high level questions of things I care about, um, as I mentioned, and I've said, you know, my NGO has, has particular values that we, we consider to be most important, um, not surprisingly around like saving lives and reconstructing the economy so that, that we can uh, exit out of the region and, and provide proficient aid um, so that they can sustain themselves. So what I'll do now um, is I'll kind of come over, I'll show you one more one more mind map that I worked on um, and just give you a high level sense of what my research kind of looks like. And then we'll get a little bit into some of the, the modules that I use in, in developing my, my hypotheses and my uh, conclusions. So here, I'm very zoomed out uh, at a high level. But what I've done is First of all, I've, I've ref I wanted to refine my area of interest. So I know that somewhere in Pakistan, I'm interested in something. Uh, I'm interested in providing aid. So first, I want you to sense you know, where were things impacted. Uh, I want to crowdsource, you know, leverage on the ground information. Um, and this is where I've actually associated a couple of different maps, um, and I've added them just as images in this situation to the, the environment so that I could see, you know, where are the most where the most active regions are. Um, making the assumption that where the active regions are are probably either highly populated areas or are areas that have not been provided enough aid. So I've also filtered down using um on, on areas that, that need more aid. Um, so I can see, you know, no aid received and it's in the sugar per region. And pardon me if I, I butcher that name. Um, I've also you know, mapped out some Facebook responses, pulled together some damage reports. I've gotten a sense of where other NGOs are currently working to provide aid. Um, and I've kind of gone through this whole process where I figured out not only where are people working, I've now figured out where I think I should work. I've figured out the resources that I could provide potentially. So, um, you know, given the current impact, the different aid mechanisms that I've got available to me. And then I've gone and I've kind of asked the question of do resources do we have resources available to the region, we being the NGO? So I've got a map of my current activity and, and information that 
uh, my NGO is compiled and put into the application or put into a mapping application that we can consume here in this application. But what I'll do is I'll kind of start fresh, just give you a sense of how this would combine. So I'll spend five, ten minutes here walking through the different components and, and give you a sense. So what we may want to know is we might start with a high level question. We might want to say, you know, where should we deploy our help? Let me ask, you know, do we have what kind of funding do we have to support this mission? And we may ask, um, uh, we'll say, what type of aid can we provide? So there, you know, kind of laying out some simple questions that we may care about. So the first thing you ask here is where should we deploy our help? Um, well, I probably want to know where are we currently. Now, to do that, I've, I've created a map, and what I've got is I've got my map over here in the left side. So in the left pane here, which I didn't walk through, are the different items that have been associated with this particular workspace. So I can look through here. I can see here the map of my NGO's current support in, in uh, support locations. And what it'll do is it'll just take a second here to load up all the data. And here from a high level, I can get a sense of where we're currently working, um, where we have people. But what we're interested in this situation is our work in Pakistan. So I'll expand this out. I'll zoom into Pakistan, get a view of, of the region. I have an outline of kind of the bounds of the region. And I've also got these different nodes of the different areas that we're currently helping or providing uh, aid to, to, to people in the Pakistan region. So with each one of these, we have different icons representing different uh, work uh, activities. So you know, different conflict management, we have different uh, flood response around health and roads and, and farms. So what I can see here is we have you know, sort of people throughout the, the region that we may be interested in. And also what I want to know is I want to know where aid is currently being provided. Where are, are areas that are mostly covered? So leveraging the Shahidi data as well as um, some data I found around um, current help locations. Um, I can see here most of the help as denoted by these black icons up here uh, is being provided in the northern part of, of the region. So through combination of uh, I, visualizing where it is currently being um, brought uh, to the region as well as where we currently have resources deployed, um, and with each one of these you can uh, Get a little more, well, you can, you can get a little more information about them and see if there's any sort of comments or, or date and time information about the given region. And I can save this down. So as I'm going through, I have my where is, you know, where are we currently deployed. So I have my NGO support map that I'll bring and I'll associate with my environment. Uh, we have, also have uh, current aid being provided, and we have our current aid location. Now, just taking a step back as to how it is determined where currently aid was being provided, I'm going to come into some of the other, the other tools we have here in the environment. So I'm going to come in this situation into our search module. And what our search module provides is search capability or rich search capability across uh, a large corpus of information. So in this situation, we're looking at about 150,000 pieces of information. And what I'm interested in is I'm interested in the Pakistan region. I'll filter down Pakistan. I want to know about NGOs, and I want to know only vetted analyst documents, we'll say. So here I'm down to a list of a couple documents. Um, we can see, you know, these are, are sort of news documents about um, statistics of, of the flood relief um, as to, you know, who's providing help, where and when. What I'm going to do is, is take one step back um, because I know I have a, a particular document that I'm interested in. Um, that has all of the NGO support, and that is going to be the and what I have here, as I mentioned, my 2010 Pakistan Floods Wikipedia document. And what we do um, throughout the process in that map, even, we have sourcing back to the original document. So if you wanted to see where I got my information from, you can come back to this, this source document and get a sense of that. So here, within the, the, the Wikipedia document, I kind of scroll through, I kind of see, you know, what nation to provide what help in this situation. 
organization, but I want to know more specifically kind of the, the non-government organization picture. So within the non-government organization picture, um, the first thing you'll probably notice is a number of colored lines. Those colored lines are, den are denoting the different entities within the document, um, red being organizations, green being places, and blue being people. So we can visualize it this way, or if we're looking at a large document like we currently are, uh, we can visualize it in a sort of cloud view. So if I want to see, not surprisingly, uh, it references Pakistan a lot, I can filter it out and say, you know, show me information that's mentioned 30 times, you know, there's a lot of BBC, FN, uh, public domain contributors, um, things of that nature. We can also view it in a list view if I'm looking for a specific person, filtering by, by person. Um, but what I want to do here is get a sense of where NGOs are providing support. So to get a, a quick snapshot of that, and not that it's the most precise method, but it's a very quick and, and easy way of doing it. I can come in, I can highlight the text within here, I can add tags if the natural language processor missed a tag, but I can also do things like add annotations. So, you know, if I want to make an annotation about a given area, you know, I want to maybe say, save the children no longer providing help to any region, you know, let, let this sort of collaborative document sort of come to life and, and let others leverage the, the information that you're providing in here. What I can also do is I can do things like create snippets. So with these different highlighted pieces of information, I can actually drag and drop them into what we call a virtual document, which lets you take lots of pieces of lots of different documents, bring them over, and then it preserves all of the sourcing information back to the, the document. I'm just going to pull some of these in. Pull some of these in. And the way that I, I created my map that I, I showed you earlier is now that I've, I've sort of created this, I had you know, grabbed the snippets that I'm interested with in the document, I can now say send the map. So I've now got uh, all the organizations and, and what they have as a description of where they're providing aid and what type of aid they're providing. So with send the map, it'll take all the geospatial references within these snippets, if there are any, um, and it'll, it'll open up a map and it'll create a layer out of the uh, virtual document that I just sent to the map. So here I can quickly see at a high level the different regions referenced. Um, here you have a number of nodes in, uh, in Pakistan and, and you probably have a headquarters node up here in the northwest of the U.S. So with that we know we have some Pakistan information that we're interested in. And I can drill into Pakistan and I can do something like can drop a little shape file on here. You know we provide very very intuitive easy to use functionality for, for editing the different uh, areas here. Um, throughout the application, it's, it's very drag and drop centric, so trying to do these things in a very easy to use manner again. Um, also, bringing over the place names of those uh, references within the document. So, again, you can see most of those references are up in the northern part, which is why I sort of concluded that, that we are primarily focused in the middle region. One other thing that led me to be interested in the sort of central part of Pakistan was some of the severity. Uh, data that I found. So what I can do is I can grab some flood severity information um, from open source uh, servers, and it'll take just a moment to load it up. But it'll bring back a, a sort of heat map type thing of, of where information is, is most, or where the most damages, damaged regions are located. So to know by the red is the most damaged, yellow is medium damage, and clear is, is not as damaged. So what I can see is there's you know, not a lot of aid being provided up here. Um, I'm sorry, there is a lot of aid being provided up here, but there's also this sort of central node of, of damage that's occurred down here. So what I've got uh, also here, as of, well, we were waiting there for a moment, I loaded up a different layer just to, to give a different map so we could potentially zoom in and see what the damage might be exactly. Um, through my process of creating this information, I actually created a, oh, and I may have, ah, Yes, I created a shapefile, um, and I can export shapefiles from Savannah or into Savannah. Um, and what I did is a high activity region, and I identified an area that I thought that we should pursue. So based on where other organizations were working, where flood severity was high, I've identified this as an area of high Ushahidi activity, as well as an area that, that is, is not yet being uh, tended to as needed. So as I come in here, Maybe what I want to do is just turn some of these different things off so that I can see just the satellite imagery. So I can drill in. I can see the, the area. I can see there's, you know, a number of 
sort of dead banks around uh, the river there, and they want to go you know, specifically over to the uh, drop a little shape on there. So there I can see there's one of the major cities, and I can also see within my, my search results here, I can see a list of populations. So, you know, the region has roughly uh, 25,000 people, according to the service we're hosting to in this situation. Um, now that I'm deriving these maps, I can locate down into an area of interest. I now want to know, you know, I've now identified a region of interest. We're saying I've arrived at some sort of conclusion to say um, I'm interested per region. And what I may want to do is, is just add an annotation so that others know why it is that I've, I've decided that. Um, so I can come and I can say I have determined this region and there is low NGO activity, high damage, and we have people within the region. Region. So I can add annotations that way. I can also do standalone annotations if I just want to sort of throw notes on my, my mind map here that aren't necessarily uh, related directly to a node. But with that, um, I can start to associate these different concepts that I'm driving to the different questions that I'm asking. So a very simple clicking mechanism. Associate these up. I can also change the type. So if I want to say this is actually a supporting node, I can change the type there. I'll change the type here. Just to sort of give a visual cue as to, as to what this conclusion is and what, what supported it and potentially what disproved it. So you know, maybe this was a different note that I was interested in. I want to say this is a, a disproven node. And with that, you, know, you may, again, want to annotate. So again, trying to, to collaborate on these workspaces in a way that lets everybody get their, their task and knowledge into the environment so that it's, it's leverageable through the community. So you know, I, this disproves because of you know, uh, my activity. And I know that that's not exactly correct. So maybe I, I associated that with something that wasn't correct. So we can obviously come in and delete, and it'll keep lineage on who made the delete, when, where, and why. Um, and the why comes from the annotation. So when I've gone through this problem, uh, I've gone through a number of things around where can we can provide it, what we can do, where we can deploy help, um, using some of the other tools you see up here, things like link charts. So with link charts, I can make more forensic representations of, of information. So what I wanted to know is kind of who in the Pakistan uh, government was, was influential and kind of what their name was and, and uh, you know, what their title was and to see if potentially they were a person we wanted to reach out to, a person of interest. Um, we've got some other components around images that you saw, as well as virtual documents, which is the combination of, of these snippets. But as you're going through these problems, the idea is you have all these different tools that you're able to work on and leverage. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, as I mentioned, not only can you collaborate within this workspace, but we need to provide some sort of output. I've now been tasked with something. I need to you know, be prepared to brief the information that I've derived to potentially my superior um, in, in an offline state or in a more briefing, formal type briefing. So what we provide is the ability to create those briefings. So, I've you know, created this where should we help node. Let me save that off. Where should we help? So using a built-in uh, screenshot tool, we can save those off. Uh, and then I can come over into my briefing. I will maybe we'll do one other thing and we'll kind of say, here with the map. Again, it takes just a moment to load up the data. And we are interested again in this region. And we want to know the other nodes here. So what I'll also do in this situation, I'll save this image off. So you can take a screenshot or you can say save map image, um, which saves a higher res resolution version. Uh, Pakistan. Save that off to the desktop. Put that away. And now we'll head over to our briefing editor, which will allow me to assemble uh, briefings. So. Here, um, sort of similar, a uh, very similar version, easy to use version of PowerPoint. So with that, I can create a new briefing. I want to apply a background. So first, we'll, we'll throw the um, the cover slide up. Um, we'll get a sense of, of you know the presentation itself. I'll then you know come in and I'll start to add new slides. 
I'll use the slide template that we used today in my presentation um, when we were talking earlier. And I'll start to add some different uh, screenshots that I took. So maybe we want to you know, cap first this one of you know some of the things I considered and where we're kind of deploying and working. And again, we can come in here and, and add annotations to the environment. So um, based on current work, we can provide help here. Help um, for roads and uh, help and general labor. And again, we'll just add one more slide. We'll apply the template. And then we'll bring that other image of the map itself in to show where uh, we're performing work in the environment. So sort of looping back uh, to the starting line presentation, uh, the idea is to bring together a number of tools, a number of data sets, and a number of users into a common environment so they can work through problems. As I discussed, um, I would mention more of the Shahidi stuff. And um, the way we can leverage that is, is through a lot of the services that they're providing. Um, being an open source organization, it, it makes it relatively easy for us to integrate uh, and deploy and, and uh, deploy alongside of uh, and allow users to leverage the data that's being sent into their environment, allow them to visualize it in our environment. So once I've created these briefings, I can export to PowerPoint. Right now I won't do that. I'll close out, close out, and we'll get into uh, a couple questions. So just sort of scraping the surface of, of the modules here. Sharing. Um, some of the tools in the environment. Uh, that's, that's the sort of high-level walkthrough. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks to the Thetis uh, Corporation, to um, Hayden and John. Um, and I see some people are starting to type some questions. So um, anyone have any questions? I see Ruth is typing. Heather, thanks you so much. And, uh, <laughs> feel and free oh, I guess one of the things that, that I could put up um, is my email address. I'd be more than happy if, if questions arrive later or, or you want to have a follow-on conversation. Um, we can provide that. Sure, it'd be great to know who to contact for more information. Yeah, so, yeah, I think, uh, there we go. So I have a QA. Um, I'll kind of put that off for a minute and try and see if I can see any questions that may come in. I see here a question from Ruth. She said, apart from shapefiles, what other geospatial data formats does Savannah support? Sure. So um, out of the box, um, we support shapefiles and KML, um, so trying to conform to some of the, the industry standards on that side. Um, we also support um, direct connection to um, Esri Arc server, so we can consume any of the data that is um, being provided as a service through that. So the way we kind of handle, you know, as people talk about the different uh, geospatial types, we let, we let Esri be sort of specialist in their field. You know, we don't want to recreate all of the, the data that or the functionality that a, a, an ESRI has that would take you know, 20 years. So what we want to do is be able to consume the information that's being produced in those environments. And so we can consume as well as write back to an ESRI server. And so that's sort of the, the integration of the geospatial side to date. Um, we have other um, capabilities or, or APIs available for extending upon the current functionality, um, but the, the focus of the application is probably not done primarily or in geospatial to date. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions, folks? Um, how does the licensing or sort of, um, you know, if, if someone's interested in, in using data, is trying it out, do you have different kinds of ways for corporations versus NGOs or educational institutions? How does that work? We do. So um, that's a good question. There are a couple of different options. Um, on the commercial side or the government side, we're primarily offering uh, user-based licensing. Um, we've also got enterprise licensing and service-based. So you know you can get uh, six months of Savannah for X amount of dollars per user. Um, for NGOs and educational facilities, um, we primarily waive most of the licensing and then charge a certain amount for product support and maintenance, um, given on, you know, depending on what size the deployment will be. 
Um, you know, obviously in situations like this, I understand that the crisis mappers isn't exactly uh, got a lot of extra cash laying around to buy software. Um, probably applying it to things that are, are more necessary at this point. Um, so in that situation, what we ask is basically help us cover our costs in, in providing help to you and in, in providing, um, you know, uh, resources, human resources, that is, um, to the organization, and, and we'll sort of float the rest. Okay, great. That sounds uh, very reasonable, something I'll definitely look into. Um, any other questions from the field? I assume if you do, you can contact Hayden um, directly at the email that's that's listed there. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, thanks again to our Oculus GeoTime hosts, and we hope to see you next week for the next uh, installation of the Crisis Mappers webinar series. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.